Jordan, what? Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the Dean Callan Show. Today, I have a very special guest in uh, Dale DeGroff. And obviously, he's waiting in the green room, so as much as I'd like to do a big, long-winded intro, I'm not going to keep him waiting. And in fact, I'm going to keep this episode as concise as I possibly can. I've even prepared questions rather than just the random, you know, whatever comes out of our mind, stream of consciousness kind of stuff that we normally do. Um, so yeah, without waiting any, any longer, uh, Dale, can you hear us? Hi, Dean. Hi, Dale. How are you? <laughs> <clears throat> um, so yeah, I think everything seems to be seems to be working. We've got comments coming through already. Um, all good signs. Uh, I'm obviously this is about as nervous as as you'll ever see me. Uh, I've been a big fan of yours for a very long time. Um, so I'm really excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much for saying yes. It's uh, it's, it's huge. Um, so I guess, um, how, what have you been up to? How, how have you been? Well, we um, got out of New York right after. Well, no, actually, and uh, we have a new house. Oh, nice. My office, and it's in a tiny little corner of the thing right across the board, island. And, and there's a photo in I'm, I'm, hearing, I'm getting a tiny bit of um I am getting a tiny bit of a like a it's I'm missing little snippets. Could you just say um Sally sells seashells by the seashore for me and <laughs> we'll see if we catch oh, it. I got the better ones in that we speak with the tip of the tongue, the lips and the teeth. Or how about <laughs> this one? Whether the weather is cold or whether the weather is hot, whatever the weather will weather the weather, whether we like it or not, or Oh my god. Uh, a flea and a fly and a flu were in prison, so what could they do? Said the flea, let us fly. Said the fly, let us flee. So they flew through a flaw in the flu. Or we could just go to Dylan Thomas. Now, as I was young and easy under the apple boughs about the little house, as happy as the grass was green, the night above the dingle starry, time let me hail and climb, golden in the heydays of his eyes. Do you want me to hook up my microphone? Um, it sounds much better now. It, you, you sound great. I think, um, I think I may have solved it. Um, my effort yeah. is gone. And, and you can't see the comments, but I mean, I'm going to throw, I'm going to add this to broadcast so you can see it. Seems much better now. <laughs> um, and I, you know, way better sound from Diogo, who's a, who's a good friend. So yeah, we got it. It's happening. Wow. Um, so good. So you moved into a new place and you're comfortable and everything's good. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I'm 72 and <clears throat> the, the rat race in New York, plus the taxes in New York are so high and we, I know this area really well. My mom lives 12 minutes from me in another state. I'm on Connecticut. She's across the river in Rhode Island. I can walk to her house in about 12 minutes. She's 93 yeah, nice. years old. Nice to be hanging near home. With mom That's around. amazing. And yeah, both still alive. Uh, speaking of family, I've seen Leo's been doing a lot of fishing. I follow him on uh, social media, obviously, and he looks yeah, like he's having a good upstairs. time. He's upstairs in his room. He's borrowing a room from us. For about three more days until he moves into a place out by the beach. He's also out of work and he's going to live. He's brought a little boat. He's been just fishing and he's going to wait it all out in his fishing boat. Although it's getting a little cold to be out in the water now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sadly, but nonetheless. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear he's, he's uh, happy and he's healthy because uh, he was obviously, before I met you way back in, I think it was 2007 or at 42 Below Cocktail World Cup was the first time we met. Um, I remember I met Leo first, and uh, I had a chance to... What's that? Were you in New Zealand with us? Yeah, yeah. I was... Do you remember there was a guy that was, like, given to, to you guys as kind of a bar back? When you were doing the, like, coffee blazer on stage, I was with Leo helping. Stage. You were the guy. That, that That's was me. Funny. I was the fresh-faced, like, super excited kid. That they were like, I know you're a big fan of Dale. Dean, you can be his bar back. And I was like, yes! And then you already had Leo, so I just hung out with Leo the whole time. Um, it was uh, it was really exciting for me. And I was going to ask you questions like, do you remember in two thousand seven you made a Cafe Brulo, or as you as you said, you know, in New York, I think it was, it was a Cafe Diablo, um, and you had a cast strength whiskey underneath, and you lit it on fire, and you had this brulee brulo bowl. Um, 
Do you, do you remember what whiskey it was? I was going to ask you something silly like that, but we, uh, tried to, we never tried to waste anything good down in the copper pan. You know, we would use you know Bacardi one fifty one because it would made great fuel, <laughs> and it was after all just the fuel. Yeah. We would actually make the lasers out of the Lafroy or some other good uh, malt scotch, which was probably what Jerry Thomas was making them out of when yep. he when he. Um, but but the Cafe Brulot was in the bowl. I would never use a malt scotch for fuel, but you may be thinking of the Blue Blazers, which we did use the malt scotch for. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I was, but but that's the thing. I, like I was just so excited, I didn't even remember a single recipe. I just remembered the stories you told, um, and hanging out with Leo. So yeah, it was a, it was exciting times for me. Um, um, so you got a pint? Yes, I do. I got I got myself one because I I've I've realized when I get nervous I lean onto the bar and I destroy the place. It's better if I've got something in my hand. Let's do um, a toast. Come on. Yeah. Oh wait. Ready? You ready? Cheers. <laughs> I gave you the sound effects. Awesome. All right. So I have now six questions ready for you, and um, I wanted to focus on uh, your new book because obviously the craft of the cocktail was a massive influence on me. Um, it was one of the books that I recommended to everyone that I met when, the, when, when I started, the people that started bartending, when I started training them, um, as it was recommended to me by a bartender I was looking up to at the time, um, because the recipes were solid. You know, if someone asks you for um, a classic and you make it according to the, your recipes in those books, they work. Um, so when I seen that you were updating the, the book, I thought to myself, like, I want to see what changes have been made, um, you know, what, whether the attitude of the book has changed, whether you've added some new uh, cocktails in, you know, for example, is the penicillin in there? Is that considered a new modern, modern classic? Um, and the first thing I seen when I looked into the book was, um, and I, I, I'm a big believer in, as people, as people uh, you know, get older and they see more of the world or as the world changes around them, you know, they're, they're going to have a different style and their, their approach is going to be slightly different. So I looked through and I compared them. And the first thing I noticed was that that very first image of you, um, you're very well dressed and, you know, you're on top of the world. And as, as you worked in the Rainbow Room, which was, you know, right up at the top of the Rockefeller. Um, and then in the new book, you're still drinking the same drink, but you're a lot more chilled. And I kind of thought to my, where is it? Where is, uh, yeah, there's the new book. So in the new book, you're a lot more chilled. And in the old book, as you can see on the contrast, you're very well dressed. And I thought to myself, I'll ask you the question. Is that a, a, in your mind, a representation of where you are in your life? You're a bit more relaxed now. Or do you think that the the kind of the clientele and the attitude of cocktail bars has kind of changed a little bit, and maybe the dress code has has dropped off in the last twenty years. No, I'm sorry to be walking around with a camera, but the doorbell rang, and I was expecting a box of booze. To tell you the truth, I want to, and you have to sign for it in this country. You, but I, my son beat me to the door, so he signed okay. for it. Yeah, you know, it had nothing to do with with whether it had to do with a couple of things. <clears throat> Number one, I was wearing a tuxedo, and at the in the last years couple of years of the promenade bar at the rainbow. I was not behind the bar anymore. And that was a union mm. issue. Uh, but I, I, I could go behind the bar anytime I wanted, but unions are strong uh, in that, in certain, uh, that particular union, which was called local six was pretty strong. And they wanted, they didn't want a management person. I mean, I was the beverage manager and I was the head bartender and yeah. I did in that bar from the beginning, right up until about 19, 90 early 1998 and then the union i was kind of the sticking element of the second contract with the union they wanted me out from behind the bar um <clears throat> because they wanted a dues paying union guy back there and not oh. a manager oh so you uh, weren't part of the union you know they paid dues for me in the early days to just to make to make the union feel good about it but for some reason they decided that I had to choose be between being the beverage manager and being the head bartender. Yeah. So 
they they made me do that and it didn't they didn't care by the way in my in my tuxedo when friends came in i went behind the bar and i made drinks anytime i wanted i could stay back there for eight hours if i wanted yeah. as long as there was somebody else two people filling those two nighttime slots <laughs> and i would be the third they didn't care so you're not you're not taking away from people's earnings you're you're not taking people away from the position i see yeah that's anyway, I did go back and make drinks in my tuxedo. So you saw me in my tuxedo because that's what I was wearing yep. at the end. Well, now in the new book, I'm not affiliated. I mean, I, I'm not affiliated with a bar or a restaurant. And the publisher suggested that rather than put on like a, a vest or some stupid jacket or something, that I should just be casual. So that's me sitting on my porch, I think. Let me see what the picture is again. It's me sitting on my yeah. porch, right? I, yeah. I think you just... Um... It's, it doesn't my really, it's, it's nondescript as to where it is, I think. Oh, no. Actually, this is not me on the porch. This is a this is taken by Daniel Krieger, the, the, the photographer for all of the drinks in the book. A wonderful photographer. Works a lot for the New York Times. And he did this at Kenta Goto's bar called Goto in Manhattan. Oh, nice. I've been there. Yeah, it's really cool. Okay. I didn't recognize the bar right away. Oh, well, now, I, wasn't maybe, gonna, I haven't spent enough time in there. That was it. Very cool. So, um, hey, what, do you think that the, the bar industry has kind of become a bit more casual in the past 20 years? Or are they well, getting more serious? Um, there's lots of kinds of bars. We all yeah. know there's so many different kinds of bars. I mean, when I went to Manhattan, there were thousands of bars. I mean, it was just like a, such an eye opener for me when I went to actually live there. Um, <clears throat> you know, you had your neighborhood spot which was really a living room more than anything else. You know, you had your extended family there and your friends. And it was just because our apartments were so tiny. I mean, for the first several years I was in New York, I was living in closets no bigger than the room I'm in right yeah. now. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the the midtown bars, the classic cocktail lounges, the supper clubs, the, the sports bars. The, there was just so many, many, many different kinds of bars. It was hard to say whether they, you know, there were bars where like the Rainbow Room was was – exceedingly formal people came in their tuxedos in their evening where we never had fights you know in the whole all the many many years i was there i only had to go over the bar once in all those years <laughs> the idiots decided to get into a fight with the boss but you know people were in their best behavior they were well dressed yeah yeah uh, so, so it depended on where you worked uh and what kind of a place it was what they served you know mm. uh lots of different you know yeah, so I guess it hasn't changed. It just depends on what, what your fancy is. Uh, that's so what has much changed? Cool. I'll tell you what has changed in bartending. Bar teams. Mm -hmm. There were no bar teams when I started, believe me. If, if you work in an Irish placement, I did work in a couple of them. Uh, if you happened to be uh, alone behind the bar, that was great. But if you were not alone behind the bar, one guy had his cash register and there were the big old nationals and the other guy had his cash register over there. You got your own drawer. You didn't touch the other man's drawer. He didn't touch yours. Yeah. And then, you know, on a busy Saturday night, you might get called in on Monday morning and the owner would say, look, uh, Bill, he, he turned 3000 bucks in his register on Saturday night. You turned about 1800. What the fuck's going on? You know, a couple wow. more Saturday I'm going to have to find somebody else in here, you know, and that's the kind of environment. It was strictly competitive. Now there was a certain amount of, you know, uh, camaraderie. You would go to your mate's bar and put a twenty dollar bill in the bar, and you drink free all night. He'd come to your bar, put a twenty dollar bill in yeah. the bar, and drink free. But there was no bar teams like we have today. Like like Sean Kenyon out there in Denver. Mm -hmm. and Two places he takes he closes for a week and takes his bartenders to scotland these guys are never going to go anywhere they love their jobs they get paid well they teach. it's a great place to work it's exciting and it's creative they have input in the drink lists yeah it's team we even have we even at tales of the cocktail have an award for teams this stuff never existed you know before and the and the other thing that never existed was this incredible um along with the team is all the things that that surround that that that's that's the bartenders uh, taking care of their own, you know, in a way that I never saw before either. Like 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 the ladies, our our, our friends um, who run uh, Speed Rack. Speed Rack, yeah. And they're 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 raising hundreds of thousands of dollars for 
for people in the in the service business with breast cancer. Yeah. Tony Abu, who has the uh, the Helen David Foundation, doing the same thing. When when our friend up in the zigzag uh, bar in in Seattle needed open heart surgery, oh, in two weeks they raised over two hundred thousand dollars for that yeah, surgery. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? You know, and and social media plays a, a part in that as well. That people are more connected to their than they've ever been before. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, well, they're connected in one sense. I mean, in, in in the sense of the bar teams, yeah, there there's a tremendous amount of, of connection and and communication. But I, I'm 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 doubting whether in the rest of the world these these massive uh, amounts of communication we suddenly have at our fingertips are are really making us commute. I mean, communicate better, or are they just getting in the way now? And yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess the way people communicate on social media is not the way that they would do face to face. So it's. They're, and it's not being used the way we thought it would be used, is it? Yeah, well, I, I, it, for me personally, I, I've now set limits on my social media. So if I'm on there more than 45 minutes a day, and bear in mind, that might sound like a lot of time, but my show is on, on, on Facebook. I've actually, I made the mistake, I went to a rally um, recently and went live on Facebook uh, from my show showing the bartender rally where they were protesting um, the way that the government's dealt with uh, the hospitality industry here. And um, my <laughs> live stream got cut off because it was like, you have used all your social media time today <laughs> on my phone. Yeah, I had, to, I had to then click like, allow me to use more today and go back on. But uh, it keeps me more productive, I guess. I've gotten back to well, putting music you, on in the background. Not coming to your door and, and dragging you off to prison because you said something on your show that was not, you know, like in China. That didn't oh, right, agree. Yeah. I mean, so so really, social media is being used uh, for as many. It's being used for good, but it's also being used by by deaths and other people for for ways of controlling people or or uh, keeping tabs on people. So it's it's not as it's not this miraculous communications that we thought we were in for in the beginning. <laughs> so Jake, do 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 you know you know Jake Berger from yeah. Uh, yeah. So Jake is on online and he's commenting. He's just uh, he's just said, uh, you know, he's told one of his stories. Um, so he, I had to make a Sazerac for Dale in Leeds circa 2003. We didn't have any Peshad bitters at Mojo. Um, we knew he'd order one, though, so we'd arrange for some to come in a taxi. So I had to stall him for 10 minutes until they arrived. He probably still thinks I'm really slow bartender to this day. Uh, Lisa it's Larson what, had to carry Leo to his hotel that night. Good times. It's one of the great <laughs> ever. And on the, I, I love everything about that bar. I love the soundtrack. And he did take care of my son in a very nice way. My son kind of got overserved. That was his first big, big, massive experience with alcohol because he was underage for America. So he went kind of oh, yeah. overboard. He went kind of overboard. Yeah. And, uh, but Jake and those, those things happen. Like Leo's very reserved today. He's he's very in control of his his yeah, uh, himself. He's, but he's, you, you live you live and you learn. He's he's a, he's a little more disciplined. <laughs> anyway, um, I, so, love Jake, I love Jake's bar. Jake's I love his amazing. Jake. Um, so I have a question. I want to I want to keep. I want to try to be as concise as I can because uh, I I I know that I will carry on talking forever. Um, so Adrian Wall has asked, um, what do you think of uh, the tiki revival and what's your favorite tiki drink? You know, the, the the tiki thing. First of all, here in America, post prohibition, that was the only cool mixology happening. I mean, that was that was for, for thirty years the only interesting thing happening because there was so there were there was so many you know roadblocks to making classic old drinks like for example a lot of the products didn't exist anymore mm. you know very few of the bitters uh, uh brands made it through prohibition and a lot of those uh, ingredients that came from overseas were <clears throat> we were their biggest customer a lot of them went out simply went out of business and it was a long time and then and, and there was no there was no uh skilled labor because a lot of the good bartenders retired or they went to europe you know harry mm. craddock uh, 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 Harry McElhone, all these guys who have worked in New York, they're all in Europe now and they're doing really well over there. Uh, we did get a couple of people come back from Europe on the, at the fancy hotels and, and in some of the fancy hotels there was some good mixology, but out, out in, in the, in, and by the way, we only had about 1,500 spirits right after Prohibition mm. in the United States, whereas today 
Well, there are 6,000 gyms worldwide right now. <laughs> I know. There's, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, a lot yeah. of gin. Uh, yeah, and it's, nuts. It's, it's total spirits right after Prohibition. Yeah. So, so when these two guys came along, first Don Beach or Ernest, what was his name? Ernest Raymond Beaumont. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <You> wonder, <laughs> D O N N. <laughs> anyway, he, they were both kind of geniuses, but you know, uh, uh, Don came along first, and he yeah. he built this. By the way, when I lived in Hollywood, which is where I met my wife, I, I've had two cities in my life that were extraordinary: New York and Los Angeles. I moved into right around the corner from McCadden Place, where the original. Uh, Don the Beachcombers was, and it was still open. This was 1978. Wow! Well, you I went to Don the Beachcombers. Yeah, I was. I wasn't in the mixology. I was trying to be an actor, you know. So I walk into this joint, and it's like you know, crazy looking. You know, there's all this stuff, and I'm like, what the? And it's empty, dead empty. And there's a guy behind the bar, and I, I guess it was afternoon. You know, he hadn't got the crowd yet, but I, it, it, it obviously wasn't happening anymore. And I, and I walked in and I said, man, this, this place is something. I said, yeah, it used to be. We're closing in about four months. I said, oh, too bad. I just moved into the neighborhood, you know. And that was it. Wow. That was it. I, 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 that was my big experience. And just imagine, I could have bought all that stuff. They probably put it out on the curb, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's, it's close. madness to think that, like, something could – because if it, if, if it lasted a little bit longer, it would have been, like, Harry's Bar in Venice or, you know, where it it had ups and downs, but it kept going because it had that footfall and then suddenly becomes an institution. Well, it was a legend. I mean, all the studio heads and the movie stars hung out there, but it had passed its time. But yeah. the whole thing about that kind of mixology then was, first of all, it, economically, it was so it was such a great business man because nobody wanted rum anymore. Yeah. They, these guys had huge collections of rum from the Caribbean because everybody was so thrilled after Prohibition with having real scotch and real whiskey and real gin that rum was like, forget about it. You know, so these yeah. guys were doing something fascinating, uh, realizing that rum liked to be mixed with itself and then doing these sort of like faux tropical drinks and faux tro Polynesian food and, and creating this fantasy world, which is yeah. exactly what people were in the mood for it's after and then the worst downturn ever in the first world war and the second figure well i mean it was a people wanted an escape mm. and this hit man and and then it kind of disappeared in the 70s and, and now so do, do you have a favorite do you have a favorite tiki drink do you go to tiki bars and is there one that's the the test the mai tai the real mai tai, mai tai you know? yeah. yeah and that would be victor's mai tai don's mai tai is uh Man, that's so great. You know, uh, I met Don, the be beachcomber's last wife, when I, I was working in Hawaii for the Halakalani Hotel, which is a Japanese-owned property. It's a beautiful property. I had about three years of work there on and off, you know, flying in twice a month. And I, I became uh, became friendly with, uh, let's see if I have her. She had all of his stuff. Anyway. She had all of his stuff. All, she had all his stuff. Yeah. That's a, uh, this book, she, her, her, her husband, her husband was Arnold Bittner, and she, her name was Phoebe Beach, and she was the last wife, and they had put this together, this book from his um, notes, and I went wow. through the recipe, looking at them, and, I'm, and some of them didn't look right, and I and, and I, I said the same thing to to the bum, our friend uh, Beach Bum. Yeah. Yeah, and um, he said, yeah, he thought, well, what, what, what they did is they put together from his notes recipes that were unfinished notes. I don't think they were the finished recipes the way he wanted them. Oh. It was very secretive, very secretive. And I, I, I brought the notes back with me before this was published. Uh, and I said, if you would like, Phoebe, I, I know some really good writers in, in, in the genre. I'm going to have some people look over these notes. And, and if, you got, if, you had a, if you were of a mind to do this, they would fly out and they would come to your house and go through all of the stuff and then do a real proper book. Mm. And she said, oh, that sounds good. And then about, oh, I don't know, four months later, I get a call from Phoebe and she says, Arnold, that's her present husband, Arnold wants to do the book. <laughs> well, it's too bad that she and Arnold did the book because 
it should have been a much better book. Uh, yeah, than the, yeah. The, like actual historians and people that understand the genre is, are going to be better at actually putting things together, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, that's a shame. <laughs> So, so the Maita and the modern Tiki revival, you, do, do you have, do you go into Tiki bars? Do you, do you get to frequent them very often? Well, I certainly go into the Bums bar down in New Orleans every time I get a chance. And I went to yeah, the, nice. the 50s one down in Fort Lauderdale, which is to die for Mai Kai, I think it's yeah. called. Is it Mai Kai? And D Leo and I went together and we ordered the, we ordered the big bowl that comes with a hula dance. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It was very a hula cool. dance. Um, so so i'm gonna no i'm not i'm not i'm gonna leave it um right so i question four right this is a big one um can you teach me a drink recipe that uses your pimento bitters um sure. for me personally like i i love this coming up to christmas so I, th I think it's a perfect time for you to 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 plug it if anyone hasn't already got it um, because it just like, to me, it smells like cloves and Christmas spices and like you, I, I don't know how, but you've nailed that. Oh, Christmas, you know, so well, I'll the, story of the bitters first. And I was making it in my kitchen, uh, and I was buying the botanicals in Greenwich village on uh, bleaker street at this place that sold that kind of stuff. And of course, you know, you're not getting really primo stuff because it sits on the shelves and it's dried out. And well, yeah. some of it's supposed to be dried out, but some of it's probably pretty old and past its time. And and I was making it in the kitchen from 90, about 90, at least 90% all spice berries. And then I had some dried orange peels, some other things, you know, in there and Demerara sugar, a little Demerara sugar and alcohol, obviously. But, um, Ann Rogers, well, her name is Ann Tunerman now, but in the early days of before Ann was married down at Tales of the Cocktail, uh, she decided to do a bitters competition. And I said, oh. I said to my wife, oh, I'll enter the competition, you know. And so she's looking through the entry thing and she says, no, we're not. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, according to the entry blank here, all recipes submitted to the competition are owned by Tales of the Cocktail. No friggin' way, she said. Are we going to give up the recipe? You know, and I said, Oh, I didn't, I didn't see the little fine print there, right? So, I, and she said, Why don't you just get off your butt and 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 make it commercially? Yeah. So I called Ted Bro. Do you know Ted Bro? Um, I, Ted I Bro know the name, but I don't, I don't know. It's Jade Liqueurs, and he makes Nouvelle Orleans absinthe. Okay. He makes 1901 absinthe. Uh, he makes a tobacco liqueur, which you guys have in London, but we can't have here. And I called him up and I said, Ted, I, I, I want to send you a sample of a of the allspice bitters. By the way, the reason I use the word pimento is back in the in, in, in the days of discovery, when the Spanish Spanish, especially and the Portuguese, were discovering the world, uh, the Spaniards down in South America saw the Indians grinding up these big black berries and they thought they were peppercorns, so they called them pimentos. And so in the Spanish world, allspice has always been referred to as pimento, but okay. there was a botanist named John Ray who was in that area around the same time in the late 1600s, and he shipped a lot of stuff back to London. And when he started grinding up the allspice berries, he said, "Oh my God, this has got like, this has got like clove, but there's also cinnamon and there's nutmeg, and this is allspice, you know, it's allspice yeah. and water. and that's the name that stuck in the English language. So I called it. Yeah. Nobody mad at me for calling it pimento. She said everybody's going to think it's peppers." You know, and that is a good way to find out whether whether they actually but taste it. The but there's nothing better than uh, a, a one single word on your bottle that get, gets uh, gives you an opportunity to tell a story that will last a lifetime. Because now I didn't know that, but now I'm yeah. going to tell that story every time someone. Uh, oh, do you know why pimento? Um, it's the same. It was the same with pineapples. Like uh, ananas was the original name of pineapples back Tupi Guarani tribe. And then everyone renamed it so that they could kind of own it, if that makes sense. Right, right. But yeah. And you know, one time I had a reviewer uh, talk about my bitters in print, and he said, "And boy, you know those those pimento peppers really come through." And I thought, "Yeah, well." <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> you know, awesome. So what? Uh, so, yeah. so so what am I making? What do I need? What ingredients? Okay. Grab some rye whiskey, some uh, Italian sweet vermouth, and some French dry vermouth. We're gonna do a. Almost perfect. As a matter of fact, that's the name of the drink. Okay. It's the almost perfect, perfect Manhattan. Uh, where? Good rye whiskey. 
I do have rye whiskey. I'm looking for a very specific one, but I can't seem to see it. Uh, what is, ah, there we go. Rye whiskey. Okay. You want sweet vermouth? Uh, Italian sweet and French dry. If you can pull that one off. Oh, French dry. What have I done so here? The, you know, I may not room? have a French dry vermouth. All right, we'll go with what you got. Uh, <laughs> no, it'd be Noily Pratt, Boissier, something along those lines. So I have Cocky Dry Vermouth or I have Reserva Especial Ambrato. I might go Cocky Dry. Yeah, Ambrato is one of the things I really love, but for this, I need a dry. Okay, I'm and, on the dry. Uh, the Ambrato is a Blanc style, a Bianco style. By the way, uh, to me, the Ambrato is one of the best bottlings that Martini and Rossi has come up with in years. It's awesome. Totally yeah. awesome. Love it. But here's what you do. Uh, put your ice in. Okay. And you make it you want to make it, but I always put the ice in first and then the dashes and then the... You know, the, 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 good, the good thing about this is even if I make a mistake, um, you know, the, the bar's not losing any money. <laughs> like there's no the cost of goods here is basically whatever i spent on it and uh no one's paying so for anything it's all me we're gonna do uh like four four drops uh maybe six uh, of my bitters because it's really powerful uh four drops well you know i i say that because people overuse it because it's so powerful you have a dasher on that when you don't have a dasher. I can on that put one. a dasher on it. I've got. I, it's really funny because I've bought these bottles. You know, did you ever go? Do you remember going to Jerry's in um, Old oh. Compton Street in London? Oh, you know, I, when I worked for John, I was at Jerry's every other day. For um, John so, Downey. So you you signed a bunch of bottles with a gold uh, pen. Like I bought them. All. <laughs> I was like amazing because I figured, like, when I own a bar. Um, giving someone like a signed uh, Dale de Groff bitters is going to be an amazing gift. So they're in storage, <laughs> just waiting. Yeah, we'll see. Um, that's the problem. Ted Bro that? had, had these, that's the problem. Ted Bro had these beautiful bottles, right? That's not the bottle we use now. And he said, Dale, we're going to do like, you know, like 3,000 in a specialty bottle. I want you to sign them all. And I'm like, ay, ay, ay. So I sign them all. And then, you know, I start moving around the country. And way up on the top shelf, I see that bottle signed and unopened yep. everywhere I went. And I'm, I'm saying to Ted, Ted, we really screwed up. The whole first palette, no one's even tasted my bitters yet because they're all <laughs> in the top shelf up there and no one wants to open them, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I ended up, I think, I think that, well, this is a new one, but I think I used, I opened one of them. Um, well, so. As long as you refill it. And, and that's okay, but no one was using it, so we went to the little bottle. And all right, so do a good dash, if okay. if enough comes out. If not, do two. So one more. How much is go. coming out? I can't know. Yeah, it's a it's a all super right. small. It's uh, one of the one of the Don Lee ones. It's super tiny. The Japanese guys. All right, so I'm going to give you parts, and you can sort it out any way you want. Okay, it's going to be uh, two parts of the Italian sweet, one part of the French dry. And four parts of the rye whiskey. That's why it's the almost perfect, perfect Manhattan, because obviously perfect Manhattan has equal parts. Okay. And this is not equal parts. Yeah, see, I've never been a big fan of a perfect Manhattan. I just think a Manhattan is a Manhattan. So I'm, uh, I'm on, um, I'm on a, a new. This is it. Like it, I normally wouldn't make a perfect Manhattan. So um, if I, if I like this, it's a very good representation of how. Now, if you're gonna do four parts, sorry, one. Is that a, is that a two ounce jigger you got there, or I mean a sixty mil jigger? Yep, sixty thirty. Good. It, it'll be a big drink, but um, you know, I can. It'll have be an American it. style drink. A little sidecar <laughs> for later. We we use glasses like this and we generally fill them up, you know. All right, so I'm, I'm guessing I'm stirring it, right? Absolutely. Yeah.
And I'm going to grab... Ooh, what glass am I going to put it in? I'm going to try... I haven't figured out the net volume of this just yet, but I've fallen in love three with and this. Three and a half ounce. Okay, well, let's hope that works. Um, it's, have you seen, do you know Remy Savage? Have you ever heard of Remy Savage? Yes. Yeah, so he's got his own glassware now. And this is one of his. I love it. Super sexy glass. It looks to be... Um, it might be a bit small. About four, that looks to be about four and a half to five ounce, four and a half ounce glass. It, depending on how much dilution, it might be a little small, but that's okay. You can make, you can put a little side one there for me. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. Feel free to tell me if I'm doing anything wrong. You know, I, I'm I'm uh, I'm hoping to be able to tell people for the rest of my life. You know. I was, I was trained by Dale DeGroff. <laughs> I had to make a almost perfect Manhattan. Come on. All right. No, you have to say almost perfect, perfect Manhattan, or you'll confuse people. They'll think okay. that you don't have any self-confidence. Okay. Almost perfect, perfect Manhattan. Exactly. Um, I, I, I think... It, uh, it perfect. It's perfect for Renee's glass. Yep. It works. Yeah. A little uh, smaller window than I'd expected, but it works. So how am I garnishing it? A any way you like your Manhattan garnished. I use a really good marinated cherry. You could use an orange peel. Um, yep, I do both, actually. I just peel peel and discard. I wouldn't and then, put uh, lemon in. What's that? I wouldn't put lemon in, but I would I put an orange peel. Okay. So we've got a lot of cherries in this household because my wife, Electra, is a huge fan of cherries. So, and she loves a Martinez. So um, I make her Martinez on a re regular basis and, and she gets two cherries. It's her nice. favorite. Oh, do you know what I've just realized? What's that? I don't have a lighter on me. What an epic fail. I should have should have been pre oh, don't you don't need the orange oil it's, it's good without it okay but you know considering saying. considering you kind of popularized the flamed orange <laughs> it would have been a nice homage um where did, can i ask did, where did you what was the inspiration for that was it something was it the flame of love well it's actually it's it's a dual inspiration when when i was still trying to be an actor um an advertising agency called Lois Holland Calloway. There, I mentioned the name because it's how I met Joe Baum, my mentor. Um, <clears throat> they had an account called Restaurant Associates, which was the most extraordinary restaurants in the world at the time in New York. But they also owned Mama Leone's, which was a, going back to the 1890s, an Italian restaurant in the theater district, and it was massive. And they hired me as an actor, not as a bartender, to go from table to table to table at the end of the meal and say, so let's talk about the wonderful meal you had here at Mama Leone's. And they had a camera crew with me, right? And I would come in, my cue to come in was when the waiters were delivering the espresso and flaming a lemon peel over the top of the espresso. Okay. The waiters. That's what they did because it was tip time, you know what I mean? Very and then cool. when I moved to LA and I went to, to the famous, uh, uh, Chasen's restaurant, a Hollywood legendary. It's cl sadly closed now. It started as a chili joint in the 30s and then became a fine dining restaurant where everybody went, everybody. And the Rat Pack hung out there. And, um, well, you know the story of yeah, the Flame yeah. of Love. And Martin came in and said, Pepe, when, uh, <laughs> when are you going to have a Dean Martin drink, Pepe? I've been coming here all these years. He said, Mr. Martin, the next time you walk through the door, I'm going to have a drink for you. And when he came in, he made the flame of love, and he flamed the orange peel several times to give him the idea. First he seasoned the glass, then he did it again on top of the glass. And when Sinatra came later in the evening, and Martin said, you got to see this drink that Pepe did for me, uh, he showed him. And, and Pepe became uh, – Pepe and I were on TV together. Oh, wow. So I, and this is when I was at the Rainbow Room, and I couldn't make the – 
flamed orange peel cosmopolitan because he was making the flame of love. And I said, Oh Jesus, I'm going on before Pepe. I can't steal his yeah. son right before he does his drink. You're, you're, so you're literally I, extinguishing his flame if he doesn't get to do his thing. You know, yeah, and I, I didn't do it. It, it, it. And it was me, Pepe and um, the still a long time bartender at the round, the round Robin bar at the Willard hotel where Abe Lincoln went for a drink, you know, it's near the white house and the bartender there, uh, James, uh, if I can remember his name, uh, I hope so. Cause he's a friend. He, he makes a famous mint julep. So he was making a julep. I was making a Cosmo and Pepe was making his famous flame of love. And it was on a, a, a late night show of the era, you know, on a TV show. This is, and, it's just, it's so cool. All the, like, you've got so many great stories. And, and it leads me to a question I've got for you, actually. But before that, um, Jake Berger has asked, Can you ask Dale what does he think of dry Manhattans? And I, I as I, I said it before, I'm not, a, I was never, I've never been a huge fan of dry Manhattans. This is actually delicious, to be, to be honest. I think it's kind I, of now, nice. if you're making dry Manhattans, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change my whole mindset on dry Manhattans now. I have to tell Jake the story. Um, when I was doing the six Manhattans with six different bitters in it on the road for bartenders, mine was the driest, my bitters, because my bitters is the most bitter bitters on the market. That's why I tell bartenders, don't taste it. <laughs> Smell it. Smell it, you know. And so that Manhattan, I'm willing to bet, even though it's got some Italian vermouth, is really dry if you put a couple of good dashes of my bitters in it. If you had used Lancaster bitters, that would be a totally different drink. Well, it's also it's also it's also using a, a Willits um, 100% straight rye, and the the Willits well, guys no. make like a really what woody astringent is, dry. Is Willits bonded? Is it bonded? Yeah. Well, this one it's it's odd because it, this is a four year old. Um, What's the ABV? Say bonded. It says family estate. ABV, ABV is 55% ABV or 100% well, there proof. There you go. It's going to be drier right away because of the high ABV. But it's also going to be dry because of my bitters, even though you put sweet vermouth in. And that's what I like. Jake, I like a dry Manhattan, but I like a little bit of red vermouth, sweet Italian in there. But when I put my bitters in, it becomes dry. Okay. I made my bitters, by the way, originally for tiki drinks. Going back to our tiki conversation, yeah, I wanted that because I had a I had a, a Ray and nephew allspice liqueur at the Rainbow Room, which was taken off the market, and I wanted that flavor, but you know I didn't necessarily want the sugar. I wanted the flavor of allspice. You know? Ray, Ray and nephew had an allspice liqueur. They still have it. It's just not widely distributed. You could, oh, wow, I didn't even know about that. Um, it's, yeah. it's interesting as well. Uh, going back to your book. One of the cocktails I, I recognized that you added to, to the repertoire of cocktails was the um, Trinidad Sour. Yeah. And uh, I, love, I love the fact that you mentioned, uh, you kind of allude to Giuseppe Gonzalez's kind of personality when you, when you announce who made it. Um, awesome. Yeah. Love that. Yeah, and, Giuseppe, and it, uh, he's an ornery American, and uh, even though he's a, uh, an immigrant. And, you know, the whole thing about Americans, you know, it doesn't surprise me all the politics of the era today because Americans are an ornery bunch. I mean, they really they really don't follow rules. Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole but that's the whole thing, wasn't it? Like the, the whole country was founded on people that didn't want to be. Put on, you know, oh, yeah, <laughs> set of circumstances. Um, right, Especially so, the ones. That um, so I've got, I've got, I'm going to ask, I've got a question just come in now, if you don't mind, because um, I know just popping questions all the time, is, it, it can't be too easy, but um, in your mind and knowing, knowing that you, you, you come across early days as a, um, with, at Milk and Honey, and I, I worked at Milk and Honey a while back, like, you know, well, 10 years ago, it's not 20 years ago, but um, what was especially coming across all back in the day and, and having seen the UK scene kind of develop and the New York scene to develop alongside or at the same time, um, what is the biggest difference between uh, American and British bartending styles in your, in your opinion? 
Well, I started coming to London in 1998, and the reason I came was because John Beach invited me. I don't know if you know John. Uh, John had um, a company called Ideal Marketing, but he had another company too with another guy, which just did marketing in general. But Seagram's hired him to introduce Absolute to the UK because it was only available in the United States. And they, he created a company called Ideal Marketing to do it. And he, and um, one of the great bars, the Atlantic Bar and Grill, which opened in 1994, oh, yeah. was about four years old when I walked through the doors in 1998 to do this massive competition with Absolute Vodka. There were 250. <laughs> You're shaking your head. <laughs> well, you know why? Because I, I, they wanted me to make cosmos you know so i got a little team of guys that that uh john beach put together and i mean uh, he he found really good helpers and we set up 250 glasses and i made a huge bin of, of cosmopolitan <laughs> and they poured them out and i followed them and i flamed 250 orange peels i'm you, getting you like were, you were you were the executive chef i was getting eight flames off of one <laughs> Wooden match. I'm not oh kidding. Boom, 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 boom. And uh, and the bartender's like, "What the fuck?" They had never seen this before. You know, they're yeah. like, "What the hell?" You know, this is 1998. And the my, I, I was a judge, and the, my fellow judges were Michael Jackson, the beer hunter, Peter wow. Dorelli, Salvatore Calabrese, and um, Dick Bradsell. Dick was wow, part of the deal. What a lineup! Like was right there, you know. And as a matter of fact. I, that was my first chance to sit in Dick's bar and hang out because they gave us Dick's bar as our sort of VIP room. Yeah. <laughs> well, the main, main group was in the other room, right? And then <clears throat> there, there was really I, I, the irony of it was that like a 50 year old hotel bartender, not one of these young London cats, you know, a 50 year old hotel bartender won the won the competition, yeah, and nice. both Peter and Salvatore were like, "See, you did it, did it, professional, you know, you know." <laughs> you can imagine those two together, right? Uh, see that the man with the uh, professional, you know, and uh, and the drink is in my book. Um, oh wow! That one that, uh, if I can bring it to mind i'll say the recipe if it kind of, if it pops in my head it's in the first book and it's in the second book too because i wanted to pay tribute to that guy so that that was part of the story uh and what i noticed about 1998 drink making in london was this propensity to use like weird herbs and fruits and stuff which yeah. we were not doing at all in the united states i mean i go into a bar and some guy is busy mashing up you know, um, modeling sticks, yeah. basil leaves and strawberries, basil leaves and strawberries, right? Right, yeah, yeah. You know, those are crazy muddlers. And he's muddling basil leaves and strawberries together. And I'm going, what the, what's the deal here, man? What? And then the reason, and, and then fast forward to 2001 and 2002, I guess it was, John Downey yeah. <clears throat> comes to New York. I'm doing these things called cocktail safaris. I'm not. I'm not at Rainbow anymore. My, my little pop up bar. I call it a pop up because we closed after a year, ten months. Called called Blackbird was closed, and so I'm kind of on my own promoting my book. And so I created a little business called Cocktail Safaris, where I would take people on walking tours of four bars, four bits of cocktail, and four bits of food matched together, and then we go to the next one. And it was a walking tour, so we we had to move That's along. That's amazing. You know? That find people that were doing interesting shit, right? So Downey, he says, I says, I, I've been hired, and I got hired by New York Magazine to do a private one just for their writer, you know, and, and some friends. So I set it up, and uh, we went to, like, more than four. We went to several. He wanted to see what, what bars were doing interesting things. And, and you know, in, in that era, there weren't a lot of them. There were plenty, but not a lot, you know. Obviously, we went to some the milk and honey and places like that, uh, whatever was open at that time. Um, Sasha had just opened, and I didn't want to take them there because Sasha didn't want publicity of any kind. Yeah. So when it was all over, and, and John Downey called me up to ask me if I would be interested in coming to London. And I said, why don't you, he said, I'm coming to New York, why don't we talk? And I said, 
well, I'll see if I can hook it up so that you could be a part of our cocktail safari that New York Magazine is doing. He said, well, I should tell you, I'm writing for Esquire UK, and he was at that time. And, and so I called up the writer at New York Magazine. I said, do you mind if a guy from Esquire UK uh, you know, tags along? And he says, no, nah, I don't care. It's not a competition for us because we're in New York, they're in, LA, in, in London. And so uh, John came along, and then after we split – from these guys and they took off in their limousines, you know, they limousine just all around town. John, I said, John, we're taking one more place. <clears throat> okay. Eldridge street. And, uh, this was early on. Sasha was, this was probably 2000. Now that I think about it, cause it was really early on. Sasha was alone behind the bar in those era, in that era, you know, and we come in like two in the morning and we stayed there till almost, I don't know, dawn, you know, a long time. And he, he made us drink after drink after drink. And so we walk out the door. It was just the three of us. No one else showed up, you know. And um, after two, anyway, no one else showed up. I don't know who was there earlier. We walk out the front door of the place, and down he stops, and he looks at me, and he says, you know what, mate? This would make a cracking bar in London. <laughs> club. No, he said, make a cracking club in London. Yeah, yeah. Guess what? One year later. So yeah, figure out. doesn't mess around, does he? Open. It was the year before that that he was in London, in New York with me, and he brought Sasha over for the opening. And by then, I was the new cocktail director of the Match Bar Group because Dick had gone on to his own company. Remember the consulting company he did? A lovely young woman whose name I can't remember right now. He was off doing that gig, opening Hakusan and other stuff, you know, great stuff. He was doing great stuff. And uh, I took over his gig and reopened the player, but also taught the classics. See, so John said... The reason John hired me was what I was talking about before. He said, you know, all these young English bartenders, you know, I don't want time in my drink. I want classic cocktails. I love classic cocktails. Yeah. And all my bartenders want to make these crazy drinks, you know. I want you to come in and teach them all the classics because I can't even find a guy to make me a decent Sazerac or whatever, you know. So it, so it, I did it's that. A, it's something that gets to me a little bit having, like, I, I always go back to classic drinks. You know, I, I, it's, I, I just want... Like, like the, you know, if I want an old fashioned, I just want an old fashioned. If you yeah. reworked well, not, it. Not a really just traditional drinker. He didn't want to have a lot of foolishness. He wouldn't let, he wouldn't let milk and honey have cranberry juice. Yeah, so I know. I know. <laughs> you know what I did? You know what I did? I went out and I see, I don't, I don't think you should refuse a customer of anything. That's my philosophy. John doesn't yeah. share that philosophy. But as far as I'm concerned, if a customer wants a drink, and you can bend over backwards to make it, fucking make it. So uh, I told the guys, go out and get some cloudberry juice. It's almost the same as cranberry. It's the same color. It's tart. And, you know, it's from Norway, Finland, Sweden. They have the cloudberries, right? <laughs> so we got cloudberry juice on. And I think he caused somebody making this drink one time, the Cosmo, probably. I said, I, said, I told you I wanted cranberry in this joint, you know. And, and the guys got, well, we don't have any cranberry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I nearly got fired. I, Jacob Breyers nearly got me fired when I worked at Milk and Honey. I just started there, and um, Jacob's like, for old times, because back in the day, you know the Corpse Survivor number blue, number two. So no, but number blue, like it's 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 orange curacao swapped out for blue curacao, and it's a it's a oh, blue no, you don't know that. Yeah, well, I only so, know Corpse Survivor number two. That's okay, so like. Jake Jacob Breyers is famous for popularizing the, the Corp Survivor blue. number blue, where you, yes, li I do. you literally just swap out Cur Contro Curacao for, for blue Curacao. And the, the first time it was ever made for Jacob was me, where literally I was making Corp Survivor number twos all day in uh, New Zealand, the year after you were there, I think it was. <laughs> um, because that, that, that year, um, it was when Sam Ross was there, right? And everyone yeah. was complaining about the lemons because the lemons weren't like sour enough, but they were they, they were perfect for a Corpse Survivor number two because they weren't too sour. They were they were like Mayor lemons kind of flavor, and um, yeah. we made Corpse Survivors the whole time. But anyway, long story short, we ran out of Curacao. I I went and got blue Curacao, swapped swapped it in. Jacob made the drink famous, and then Jacob comes into Milk and Honey just just before he does this presentation, and says. Dean, can I get a, a blue corp survivor, like a corp survivor done blue? And I was like, oh. Now, I went upstairs, and in the back of house, um, they had blue curacao. 
So I grab it, I come back down, I made it. And the corpse driver number two was on the menu. And um, the boss, <laughs> the manager at the time come down and was like, you make another one of those again and you're fired because because <laughs> we don't make blue drinks. And I was like, dude, I mean, a customer asked for it. I made it. And he's like, we don't make blue drinks. And I was like, well, why are you stocking blue curacao if you're not going to deplete it? And I don't understand. <laughs> you have well, John, your, you John order blue curacao. Right? What's that? John owned the joint. And as far as I'm concerned, the owner can do whatever the hell they want. But as far as I'm concerned, as a bartender, my job, my job, is to give the customer what it is they freaking want, you know. Yeah. Now, all right, I'm reading from my book now. Okay. I want you to, this is the new book. Um, this is the Blue Bayou. It's a drink of my own. Uh, it's 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 got a rooted gin, which is a gin that I like. Saint Germain, blue blue curacao, lime acid. You know, lime acid from Dave Arnold's yep. book, yep. and because uh, it can be clear. If you if you mix lime with blue curacao, it turns green, and you don't have a blue drink anymore. So I use lime acid instead. So here's, here's what I wrote underneath the drink. I said, blue drinks are back. At least that's what my friend Jacob Breyer, Breyers claims. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Breyers is the worldwide ambassador of the bartending community for Bocardi Company, and he knows these things. <laughs> and true or not, if one, if one has enough visibility in the press, then statements like that, become true <laughs> <laughs> it's so true I, th I think it was a backlash to people just hating on things without really giving them a chance chance um but yeah. i'm gonna ask so i'm very conscious that i've, I've asked asked for an hour of your time and um we're, we're about five minutes away want. from i'm drinking i'll give you all the time you want don't worry. We're, we're about five minutes away from an hour so what i thought i'd do is i would play mitch's minute so a good friend of mine uh mitch ono bushel who's based in la um, I, I ask him a question every morning. So in my time here, it's, uh, it's, it's lunchtime, but when he wakes up, he gets a question from me and it could be anything. So, and sometimes he does it at night, the night before, because he hasn't gone to bed because he's been busy working through the night. So you get a nighttime one. Um, but he generally wakes up looking disheveled and has to answer my question and he gets one minute to do so. And then I add it to Mitch's minute. But it gives us a break for a minute and then we're back in and I'll ask two more questions and then we're, we're good. So I'll just I'll quickly cut to Mitch's minute. When did I know? Like, oh, um, when did I know? I mean, I had a lot of those attributes. I mean, I'm not particularly presentable, but I liked a lot of you know I'm, I'm a lot of people person I like the jokes I like late nights um, very systems orientated uh, I like big flavors um, but I really knew I wanted to apply myself to it when I saw Jason Crowley work for the first time um, and he was just hilarious he was just hilarious and he, and he didn't and he didn't take himself too seriously this was like 93 or 94 or something no, no, 2004 or something. And all the good bartenders were like pompous assholes. And then Jason was just hilarious. Um, he was flaring partially. He made great drinks, but he didn't want to make a big deal about it. Um, yeah, the first time I saw Jason work was when I knew I wanted to, to, to get a lot better at it and be like Jace. Go see him at Fortune and Samba and his protege Dylan, they're the best. And we're back. Um, so was that working for you? Could you hear it? <clears throat> I could hear it. Okay, cool. uh, I'm so, going uh, to I'm gonna have to take a little field trip with you. You follow me, okay? <laughs> you brought up Jason Crawley, and you need to see this. You know that my wife is an artist, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to take you around my house a little bit here. <clears throat> and I'm going to show you something. It's Jill's artwork. Uh, I'm going into the kitchen. And right over our little breakfast nook. Oh, is that. wow. Jason Corley, such a legend. That's You have breakfast with Jason Corley every single day? Every single day. So <laughs> that's, that's big, so too. That's cool. a big thing. 
Yeah. I like, so I, so I, that you know that he created that wonderful shaker machine. The Imperial Shaker, it, yeah. You know where it came from, right? Um, no. I, I, I know I know it was a reference in an old book. This is so cool. Right, now let, let me let me give you the backstory on this. <laughs> this was published by uh, a London company called Farrell ja Farrell and Jackson Limited, London, 1898, and uh, I wrote the foreword to the Cocktail Kingdom version of it. That's this one here. I got the original version too, and <clears throat> in it, I said the illustrations of 19th century tools were extraordinary a few of which have since have, uh, have uh, been reprinted in modern texts. The illustration depicting the imperial shaker was enough to make me want to search the world for this wonderful drink cranking device and build an entire bar around it. Well, guess what Jake's, Jason Crowley did? <laughs> exactly <laughs> that. Uh -huh. He built it and built a whole business around it. Uh, oh, cool. from this yeah. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, Mitch Mitch is always on point. He knows what he's talking about. And uh it's it's one of those things Mitch always keeps it real. Um yeah, I like I love that man. Um so so question number 5 or 6 or it might be 7 at this stage. Um right. So if you started over in your bartending career, you're 21 years old again. Right? but you still get to retain one of the skills you have built up over your entire career. So you get to, you get to keep the memories of this one skill. Um, what would the skill out of these three be, right? So the first is your ability to mix drinks. The second is your ability to host and, and put people at ease. So hosting people, telling stories, or three, your current product knowledge. So would you keep, your 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 mixology skills, your product knowledge, or your ability to to talk to people and put people at ease. Telling stories. I mean, come on, you, you <laughs> grind yeah. out for the rest of your life on stories. Yeah, and 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 it's not. It doesn't take that long to learn. You know, whatever mixology uh, is is happening with the bar and product knowledge, you can catch up on, but. I think me me personally, I love that you said that. I, I kind of was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> if you'd said product knowledge, I would have been like, oh no. Um, but let yeah. me end with the story. How much time do I have? Uh, you have all the time in the in the whole world. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm not leaving until you decide to hang up. This doesn't have to be the end, but if you want this to be the end, I, I will tell a story. One of the more extraordinary stories that happened to me in one of the several extraordinary places that I had the serendipity to work in one of the, the first one was called charlie o's bar and grill it was in 30 it was in rockefeller center not in 30 rock but right the building next door to 30 rock <clears throat> on rockefeller plaza where the christmas tree is right now and charlie o's was an uh, irish themed bar but it was much much more than that it was also a fantastic bar started as a waiter went there as a guest back in the late 60s because my best friend's older brother was the partner in that ad agency that I brought up earlier in the show called Lois Holland and Callaway, the agency that did the advertising for Restaurant Associates, of which Joe Baum, my mentor, was the was the CEO manager guy, creative guy, and this was one of his ideas, um, and the. Other one was the Hotel Bel Air, Bel Air Hotel in Los Angeles, and of course the Rainbow Room, you know, uh, the last one. These are three extraordinary places that I had the absolute honor and good luck to work in. <laughs> so when I arrived at the Hotel Bel Air and walked in to, Bel Air doesn't have a real lobby that you walk through, you just walk in to this series of paths that wind all around mm. these beautiful bungalows. And it's one of the great tropical gardens curated in, in the world. Um, it was at that time one of the top 10 hotels in the world. Uh, it was privately owned by a guy named Joe Drown, who was a protege of Conrad Hilton. <clears throat> Joe was still alive when I took the gig, but let me tell you how I got the gig. Um, I walked into the bar because someone, a guy in New York, told me when you get to LA, 
make a beeline for the Hotel Bel Air. I think there's something going on there. And then when I got here, I asked a friend, I said, you know about the Hotel Bel Air? He said, yeah, I know about the Hotel Bel Air. That's a really great place to work. There might be an opening there because I think they fired a day guy there. I said, no shit, really? So I jumped in my 69 Dodge Dart, valeted it, walked across this arch pond bridge where all the swans are swimming and right found the little garden signs that say bar and then i went into the bar stunning bar and sure enough there's this like six foot three red-faced irishman named jim kitchens behind the bar and i said i hear you're looking for a day man now this is one of the top 10 hotels in the world this is 1978 this shit could never go down in 1998 you know, in the era of of of, uh, of uh, HR departments, you know, yeah. human relations, ha ha ha. I mean, HR departments are dedicated to finding the wrong person for the job because if you have any personality at all, you're a risk. Anyway, I walked in the door and there he was. And he, I said, and I could see his look when I said that. Uh, I hear you looking for a day, man. Pause, pause. You know, he could have said, okay go to the office, leave the resume, blah, blah, blah. He didn't do that. He said, where did you work? Charlie O's in New York. He'd heard of it. It was a Joe Baum restaurant. Joe Baum was famous. Restaurant Associates was famous. Four Seasons, Forum of the Twelve Caesars, La Fonda del Sol, these famous restaurants, you know. Oh, uh, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Come on back behind the bar here. Let me see you pick up a bottle and pour a shot. Pick up a bottle and pour a shot. Seem seemingly easy. But of course, if you're not a bartender, mm. you would pick up a bottle and you, you know. So I picked up a bottle of shot and make me a, make me a sidecar. Okay, tough one. I had it. I said, uh, where's your sour mix? Because even the Hotel Bel Air in this era, you know, this is, this is the sad part about America. Everybody had sour mix out of a gun. That's what happened because of mm. prohibition. Anyway, even the Hotel Bel Air. So I said, um, he said, it's the one there. So I made him a sour mix sidecar. <laughs> oh, God. And, uh, and he said, okay, come back tomorrow. Black pants, white shirt. We'll supply the jacket. Uh, we'll give you a couple days try out. Well, I stayed there for six years. So my story happened at the Hotel Bel Air. And one of the things that pushed me over the hill into making bartending my life happened at the Hotel Bel Air too. I eventually got the night shift uh, a couple years into the gig. That's where the money was. Yeah. And what a night shift it was. There was a guy named Bud Herman, brilliant piano player. When I say brilliant, he played with Benny Goodman on the road. Oh, wow. In one of his old friends. They met in, in Las Vegas when, when about, about two or three years into the Flamingo, which was the first famous one, Goodman had gotten the big room. And there was lots of problems because people of color were not welcome in Las Vegas, not even in the bands. But Goodman said he wouldn't play unless his musicians could all play. But it was very difficult for them. They were treated badly. They couldn't go. They had to go through certain the kitchen entrance, they couldn't stay in the hotel, they had to find a place to stay, it was awful. And and he lost his piano player behind all the stuff that was going down. And But Bud was playing in the lounge at the same time, and once in a while, he'd be in the wings and he, you know, Goodman would bring him in, you know, say, come and sit down, play a, play a tune for us, because he'd, he'd heard him play. He knew he, he knew he was a player, you know. Yeah. And so when he fired the piano player, he called Bud, and he, he, Bud didn't know he fired the piano player. He said, come and play a couple tunes, Bud. And they finished the tunes, and Goodman walks over and says, how do you like that seat? He said, I, what do you mean? Well, it's yours if you want it. I just fired the piano player. And he took it. All right, that's Bud. He's got the lounge for 20 years when I walk in the door. 20 years playing this lounge from 9 o'clock until 2 in the morning. He owned the place. Everybody knew Bud. Everybody came to see Bud. Phyllis Diller came in because Bud would let her play the piano. She was a brilliant classical pianist, by the way, Phyllis Diller. I heard her play on a number of occasions. Uh, Carol O'Connor came in so he could sing with Bud, you know. And the song he loved to sing, Gotta Get My Old Tuxedo Press, Gotta Soul Bud, which is now my favorite song to sing, of course. So anyway, um, uh, Bud's uh, 
just introducing people. He's like the host, you know. And there was a guy, there were certain people who lived in the hotel, not a lot of them. One of them was was uh, Robert Wagner's mother. He, his dad was a big oil man. And when, when he died, his mother wanted to live at the Hotel Bel Air. So she lived there for the rest of her life. And there was a big oil man named Bud Thies who lived in the hotel because he had properties in Los Angeles, but he was from Oklahoma. Uh, he, he used so to get- bartending for people in that level of hotel that literally lived there. They're yes. Coming down every day. Yep. Wow, that's, that's the next level regular, isn't it? Yeah, Bud Thies was um, was a, a pretty wealthy guy and was living in the hotel because it was convenient, you know. And he did a lot of business there, and he had some business in Oklahoma. He used to piss all the Los Angeles off the bar by calling California, I mean, by calling uh, Texas Baja, California, Baja, Baja, Oklahoma, because he was from Oklahoma. And if he ran into anybody from Texas, he'd always use that line and really piss them off. But uh, Bud and Bud became really good friends. So one day, Bud's playing the piano, and he, he, he motions Bud Thies to come over, and then he calls another guy over, and he says, Thies, I want you to meet Bill. You guys are in the same business, and I can't believe I didn't introduce you before. So they go sit down and they talk. Okay, a couple of years go by. Bud drinks Seven Star Metaxa, and there were always four or five of them lined up. People want to buy him drinks, and they would just line them up. They wanted to see their drink up there. When they said, buy the piano player a drink, the waiters, they were old, oh, old wow. school waiters. They would put the shot on the piano so the guys saw it. Whether Bud got to it or not, irrelevant. And when I was closing up at night, Bud would bring one or two of these up to the bar, and we would just shoot the shit, you know. And, you know, one night he said to me, um, you know, Dale, I know you're trying to be an actor and everything, but you're pretty good at this bartending stuff. You ought to think about it, you know. Just, just say it. Never mention it again. <laughs> that was, that, that's not the night I'm talking about. The night I'm talking about was when Thies had come in earlier in the night, walked straight up to the piano, stuck an envelope inside of his pocket and said, Bud, remember you introduced me to Bill? I said, yeah. Well, Bill and I made a bucket of money, Bud, but, but, and, and I never even thanked you. So, and he stuck that envelope in there. So he forgot all about it. At the end of the night, he comes up and he's having his seven star attacks. It was soda. So he drank it. And he says, Oh, let's get, let's get, uh, see what Thesis got here, you know. And he reads it. Then he hands it to me. I read it. It's the deed to a 36 unit luxury apartment building right next to the Hollywood Bowl. Wow. That's a tip. That's a serious tip. Story number one. Story number two. I'm working the day shift in the in the beginning. Uh, I should have done it the other way around. Um, and nobody ate, nobody hung around in the daytime at this it lounged. We had Bougainvillea growing outside the windows of the all the tables out there. It was so beautiful. Everybody dined at lunchtime out there. But an elderly couple came in one time. They didn't want to be outdoors. It was a little too windy. And she was uh, chilly. And so she came and sat. And the one table I couldn't really see from the bar. And I went and took their order, served them. And, you know, but I didn't know at that time. But he had called up when I was setting up and said, you're the new guy, right? I want to tell you, sometimes people come in and try to play the piano. I usually keep it locked. But I broke the lock on the Steinway last night. I want you to keep the people off the piano until I get in. So, uh, I, you know, he... Uh, Sure enough, I lose track of the old guy. And when I look up, he's sitting at the piano stool and he's got his hands above the keys. He's just opened it up. And I ran over and I said, excuse me, sir. I bet you play beautifully. But I, I had a call from the uh, from the piano player, Bud Herman. If you're staying in the hotel, you probably know Bud. And, I, and I'm sure he would be delighted for you to play. And he often invites people to play uh, when he's here. But I have to ask you not to play while he's not here. Mm. Uh, and you can see the lock is broke on the, on the cover. And he said, oh, that's no, no problem, no problem. And he gets up, he goes back, gives me his credit card. I go up to the bar, I'm processing it, and then I stop. And I call the front desk and I say, can you please tell me that the Vladimir Horowitz who's sitting in, that, in my bar right now having lunch is not the Vladimir Horowitz? They said, oh, yes, Mr. Horowitz is in town for a concert. And I ran back to his table. I said, Mr. Horowitz, um, 
you can play the piano. And he said, no, 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 no. He says, you don't understand, young man. I travel with my piano. I have it with me. And I, I respect mm. Mr. Herman. So I'm literally the only person on the face of the earth that ever taught Vladimir Horowitz not to play <laughs> wow. the piano. Wow. Oh, here's, here's a poor trick to that, those two stories. I use this with young bartenders, and it has to do with your question about what I would rather keep, my skill, my, my whatever. Uh, I was only there for one of those stories. I'm not going to tell you which one. Wow. The other one I heard from another bartender at the Hotel Bel Air, and I made it my own. So let me tell you, bartenders, tell the stories. It's what we do. <laughs> so good. So good. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I think I think I've asked you every question. There was one I kind of wanted to ask you. I'll, I think it might be a quick answer. But um, did you ever go to Studio 54? It's not a quick answer, but uh -oh. I'll give it to you. 54th Street was really, really familiar to me, but not because of Studio 54. It wasn't my scene. I, in high school, believe it or not, when I was listening to the Beach Boys, and I, I, had, I had weird taste in music, Beach Boys, Kingston Trio, Tennessee Ernie Ford. I mean, I'm telling you, it was weird all over the place, you know. But my best friend's older brother was a jazz piano player, Mystic, Connecticut, probably 12 minutes, 15 minutes from where I'm sitting right now. This is when I was in high school. And at the, at the Mystic Motor Inn, they had a budget to bring in jazz stars. If I mention some of the jazz stars, they would be names you don't know. Harry Sweets Edison, Little Jazz Roy Eldridge, Max Kaminsky, Zulie Singleton, Art Tatum, Ben Webster, Coleman Hawkins. These are the kind of the people that got invited to come to the Mystic Motor and play with Bud. Mostly, mostly trumpet players, though. And in my case, I met several of them at the Mystic Motor Inn as a high schooler. Moved to New York. Fast forward. I'm leaving college to go to New York on a, on a lark. I just It was time. I was going to be on Broadway, I was sure. Living in the YMCA. But my friend, uh, my friend uh, uh, Jerry Holland, who was the piano player's youngest brother. That's how come I went to hear him play. You know, and I had by then become a real small band jazz aficionado. I mean, they were talking about the old guys, you know, from the 30s, 40s, and 50s who had small bands, not the big bands that you dance to, small bands. And and there was a, a great critic for the Herald Tribune, um, Virgil Thompson, who called this kind of small band jazz persecuted American chamber music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, on over the period of time from the 30s through the time when I moved to New York in 1969, 52nd Street had become this mecca of this small band jazz. But then buildings started to go up. And one particular club, Jimmy Ryan's club, was, was evicted by the Black Rock, the CBS building, at the corner of 52nd and 6th. They moved over to 54th Street. So by the time I got to New York, there was Jimmy Ryan's club on 54th Street. And in residence there was Roy Eldridge, Little Jazz, who played with Gene Krupa all through the 40s. Wow. There he is, this club. I met him in Mystic, Connecticut. Uh, but actually, I'm sorry, I got to re reset that story. He wasn't even at Jimmy Ryan's yet. He was down in what is today Soho at another far-flung club called The Half Note. And this was when Spring Street and Hudson was, I mean, warehouses there was nothing there <laughs> except this little corner bar restaurant called the half note with a neon sign that said half note with musical notes next to it jazz underneath well we found out my best friend jerry holland and i that roy eldridge who we met in mystic connecticut was in residence there playing with a small band and not only that mr five by five uh jimmy rushing they called him Mr. Five by Five because he was five feet tall and five feet wide. <laughs> on the bandstand. So we, we made a beeline down there. It's like our first week or two in New York. We made a beeline down there. And Roy played with Jerry's brother. Roy met us up at the Mystic Motorway. Now, I, we were both 18 years old. We were over 18 years old. But, you know, you could drink at 18 in those yeah. days. But this joint was an adult joint. And they, liked, they had the right to exclude anyone under 21 if they preferred. 
And that's that was their policy. So we're at the door with the doorman. Roy is right there on the bandstand. We can see him. And he's playing in profile on a shelf behind the bar. And he would play on both sides of this, because one side was the bar and one side was the dining room. It was not uncommon for a lot of the clubs to be like that. So the yahoos in the bar didn't bother the people in the dining room, you know. And Roy was like swinging back, sees us, leans over and says, those cats are with me. Wow. Those cats are with me. That's so he cool. Jerry, I'm sure. So we come in and we're at the bar, obviously, you know, nursing beers because we couldn't afford the cover, you know, at a table. And so uh, we stayed till four in the morning and the clubs worked, all of them, starting with 52nd Street, half hour on, half hour off from nine till four in the morning. That's how they did it. That's why the business plan worked. That's why jazz was profitable. Anyway, Roy moved uptown to Jimmy Ryan's club, 1970, and plays there for 10 years. I lived in the fucking Ryan's club. I lived there, you know, until 79, 78 when I went to LA. I was in there twice, and you know, again, nursing a beer, not anywhere near a table, on a drink rail, I'm not even taking up a bar stool. Yeah. Because the bartenders would off if we did. We'd be on a drink rail about that wide, nursing, listening to the band. And then in between sets, we'd go to the corner to Cecil's Tavern, where the beers were 50 cents instead of $2.50, right? Yeah. And the band, by the way, would also come down there because they didn't get any break on the prices either. So we got to hang out with Roy down there. Wow. So it's, anyway. It's, it's, it's interesting. That, so you that was 54th yeah. Street. That was my 54th Street. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. That That's that's epic. I, I know I asked you the, the, the Studio 54 thing, but, like, it's, just, it's one of those things. I think um, there's the, – Right now, there's there tends to be little bits of gaps in 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 history of things, and you, you, the, the movie Studio Fifty Four, for example, I watched that, and it they made it seem like the the nightclub Studio Fifty Four was this massive cultural phenomenon, and I kind of think like where are all the the where's the stories from the bartenders from there? But actually, when you tell that jazz story, so obviously you don't know this, but my grandfather was a jazz musician, right, and he's Danish. So I'm half Irish, half Danish. And my Danish grandfather traveled 50 something states with Lil Armstrong around the US playing jazz in a, in a small jazz band. And he, I, can, I can send you a link to some of his music or I could like, I could literally put it on. Um, but um, my favorite tune, have you ever, do you know the jazz song, like I found a new baby? Yeah. Um, it's a, so this is his version of I found a new baby. This is my this is my grandfather. Can you hear it? Louder, make it louder. Um so my my grandmother um went and was an actress on Broadway, traveled around the US, and then she got a job in the like I don't know, a long time ago, but 50s, 60s, whatever it was, um, hiring bands for Capitol Records, and she signed him and then married him. So I'm, wow. I'm the result of, of jazz. Wow. wow. Um, you know, I've, always, uh, I've always loved it. I loved the, the, uh, listening to it when I was... And, and I think sitting down having a cocktail you're with a Lil, band... Lil Harden. You're talking oh, about Lil Harden. Married... Louis Armstrong, right? Is that who you're talking about? I think so. Louis Armstrong's first wife, Lil Hardin. Is that who you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. Um, but because she she was part of the King Oliver band when they brought when they were brought to Chicago by the gangster crowd by 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 what's his name? You know, uh, the big Chicago gangster. Yeah. What's his name? Uh, yeah, the Scarface. Uh, you know. Yeah. He brought he brought the, the that band with the King Oliver band with a young Louis Armstrong, a young Lil Harden on piano, and they played together. And they left the King Oliver band while they were in Chicago, you know, and played together. It's a great story, actually. Um, yeah. which we don't. So, know. so it's I've always I've always I've grown up listening to my grandfather's records and listening to old school jazz music and stuff like that. And and listen to this. Hold on.
What instrument did he play? What's that? What instrument did he play? Uh, he played the trombone. And the trumpet player was was really famous. My favorite, though, um, apart obviously, apart from my grandfather, was uh, the clarinet player. Um, his name's Curly. And um, they're just, they were just phenomenal. So if you've ever heard of the, you know, the, the, the Viking jazz band in, in, in Copenhagen? So some of the, so my grandfather died a while ago, um, but some of the players went on to, to play with the uh, Papa Views Viking jazz band and different things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's something that's kind of going to, a, I, I lived in Shanghai for a while and going to, there was a club called Cotton's Club. And I used to go in there and I used to order Manhattan. And I, and I had to go up to the bar at one point and be like, this is how I want my Manhattan. Because they weren't too fussed about it. And obviously I was arrogant and young and um, I wanted my Manhattan the way I wanted it. And they, they never missed a beat from there on in. When I walked in, they made it exactly the way I wanted it from there on in. It, like, effectively, I wanted it up. I wanted it cold and I wanted to be able to drink it quickly, you know, with a twist. And they used to just put it kind of, it was kind of almost like a, like a, a boulevardier on the rocks. But... Um, they uh, uh, they had musicians come in from all over the U.S. and around the world. And when you got up out of your seat to go to the toilet, they'd be like, baby, did I tell you you could leave and stuff? And they'd interact. <laughs> and I, I, ha I, don't, I, I don't know where I can find that in London. You know, like it, 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 it's, I, it kind of feels like I've lost that a little bit. So you saying that you, you love all these jazz clubs really makes me really happy. But... Um, I think we should call it. Um, thank you so much for all of the time that you've spent. This has been an absolute dream for me. And I think despite all of the, the hardships and all of the troubles that have, uh, 2020 has brought, um, out of COVID, I created this live stream thing and, and this has made it worthwhile. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. It's, it's a nice event you have going there. Well, um, yeah, ho ho hopefully, hopefully one day that we we could turn it into a real life thing, it, like ha create an event where people sit and they discuss okay. things o across a bar. Um, thank you, thank you so much. I'll, I'll let you go, Dale. I'm gonna I'm gonna close out the show. And, All right, Dean. Uh, Take and, care, uh, mate. And you can get back to your day. Say hi to Leo for me and Jill as well. Take thank care. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> I'm a bit flustered. Right. So uh, in case you didn't notice, that was a dream come true for me to sit down and chat to Dale DeGroff, a person who has um, shaped my career for the last 20 years, I guess. And um, as you can tell, just the tone of his voice, he puts you at ease, he makes you feel comfortable, he tells the best stories, and he makes great drinks. Like the ultimate bartender. Um, and thank you for tuning in. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm still like, I'm reeling over how uh, amazing I, I enjoyed that so much. I enjoyed that so much. I don't know what to say. Um, and the internet didn't crash. Yeah, great. Um, anyway, thank you for tuning in. If you've watched this long, cheers. <laughs>